Hello and welcome to English 101. I'll be your instructor for the course. My name is Max Honer and this is the first example of the video lessons. We'll have one of these each week throughout the quarter, so 10 of these total. I'll make a quick note about these lessons and then we'll get going. These are designed to help you with the class um, rather than just giving you the reading and the assignment. Uh, these lectures are designed to help bridge the gap between those two to kind of expand on what's in the reading with my vision and my intent for the course to help you interpret how you should approach the assignments. Um, so these are not meant to give you more work or anything like that. They're meant to enhance the course um, in that we're not meeting as a class face to face, not being able to talk about these things in person. Um, these lectures take the place of what I would lecture on in the classroom and then the discussion board takes the place of the conversations we'd have in the classroom but more on the discussion board in a few minutes so I just kinda wanted to explain that basic part of these lessons for you so that you don't feel too bogged down as you're trying to do all your work for all your classes and listening to them kinda reassuring you of their purpose along those lines let me also reassure you that they'll be very short one thing that's nice about our class is we don't have a lot of content. If we, you were, say, taking a um, literature survey course from me where we did a lot of reading of different stories or poems or something like that, I'm speaking hypothetically here, in that situation we'd have a lot of content to get through and these lectures would be longer. In this course, while we most definitely look at some content, we're mainly talking about skills, specific things you can learn that'll help you with your writing. And so these lectures will be brief and almost more like a tutorial in that you'll have kind of a brief discussion of a skill and then some application of that in terms of me taking you through an example. But they'll still be much shorter than probably a lot of the lectures you'd have for other classes. So hopefully they won't be uh, too much of a burden for you. With that said, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll dive in. My name is Max Honer. I have my PhD in English Literature, which I earned from Arizona State University in 2016. Um, I've spent 10 years teaching literature, humanities, film and media studies, and of course, composition. I have taught composition in a course like this in um, every university I've taught at and pretty much every year, every quarter or semester for the last 10 years. So got a lot of knowledge as well as a lot of practical experience in terms of what students have found successful or not in my classes. And I'm going to try to apply that to these lessons in this class um, to help you become better at writing and hopefully enjoy the class. That it's not just a requirement for graduation, but it's something that really benefits you in the long run in the workplace and your other classes by giving you some foundational writing and communication skills, which is what we'll be talking about throughout the course of this first lesson. Before we get into really the topic for this lesson, which is rhetoric, um, I want to go through kind of some basics of taking classes online um, for you because I know some of you have probably taken online courses before, but for a lot of you, this may be your first online course. So I want to go through some strategies to help you succeed in it. Um, First is to manage your time well. With online courses, it's really easy to put off due dates and other similar types of deadlines and whatnot. So, um, you know, go through the first work week, maybe work a little bit ahead and, and see how long it takes you to do everything the first week. And then once you've done that, set aside some time in your schedule each week where you know you're going to do the work for the course. Um, and reserve that time for it. It can be very easy to put things off in online courses, but then you can fall behind and it gets hard to catch up. So set aside some time for the weekly work. Um, we already talked about this, but just reserving that time, setting it aside. Um, and then finally, you know, look ahead at the due dates, the different assignments. Try to work ahead if you can. You certainly don't have to. But knowing what's coming up and when things are due will help you plan out your weeks and plan your schedule. Okay. 
So now we'll talk about some strategies that are specific to this this class. Those things I just went over would apply to almost any online class. So keep those in mind if you take other online classes. Um, we don't have a ton of reading compared to one of those literature type classes that I also teach that I mentioned earlier. The reading is fairly minimal, but we still do have weekly reading assignments that are very important. And this class is meant to be foundational, not just to your writing and your English classes you'll take in college, but um, to the college itself, to your university experience. This is often the first course many students take at the university level. And for all of your classes, you'll be required to do a lot of reading and a lot of difficult, challenging, dense, nuanced reading. So um, this class is designed in part to help prepare you for that. Our first major unit, I'll talk about this more later, but our first major unit will be a critical reading unit. That'll go over some strategies for you for reading in college. Um, but just briefly now, I'd note that, you know, really devote time to the reading. Um, Reread passages that are confusing, take notes as you read, um, don't read it at the same pace as you would an article on your phone or something. To have success in the class, you'll need to do the reading so that you understand the core key concepts and you want to take some time to do that reading well. Um, reading, because we learn to do it at a young age and we do it all the time, uh, in, in it's kind of just part of our daily routine. It's, is built into it. We read texts and emails and other things on our phones. Um, we don't always think of, we take reading for granted. We don't always think of it as um, a skill, but it is. Just like writing, it can be a difficult skill to master and to do really well to excel at reading. And reading and writing go hand in hand, so we're going to work on learning both in this class. And really the first half of this class is devoted to critical reading, and the second half is devoted more to your writing, although the there'll obviously be a lot of writing in the first half as well. Um, so when you're setting aside that time each week, devote a significant chunk of it to the reading. Um, next up is the lectures like you're watching now. Again, treat this as if you were in class, um, not just a video on your phone. So um, take notes like you would during class. You know, I'll go kind of fast because we have a lot of material to get through, so pause them. Um, sometimes I'll put up questions on the screen, so if that happens, instead of waiting for the answer, you know, you might pause it and, and jot down your own answer in your notes and then kind of compare that when I do talk about the answer. So really engage with the lecture. Think of it as more interactive than um, other videos you might watch because it's a class. It's taking the place of a class, and you would ask questions if it were a class, so think of it that way. Um, in, in taking notes both while you read and while you listen to the lectures, the idea here is comes from research that shows that writing something down is much more helpful to remembering it than reading, hearing, or even seeing it is. So if you write things down, notes, annotations as you read, as well as during the lecture, you'll remember the information better than if you were just sitting there reading or watching it. So that's, that's a big tip from me to you. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to get really specific, we're getting kind of more specific as we go here. General strategies, strategies specific to this class. Here are the tasks I'm going to ask you to do each week. And this is, again, just to give you kind of an overview what the class is like. <clears throat> First, you'll want to do the reading. Um, whatever is assigned, you just click on the link in Canvas. It takes you to it. So start with that. Next is the lecture. I recommend you do the reading first and then listen to the lecture. The lecture is meant to kind of enhance the reading. Um, I'm sort of interpreting the reading and, and we're discussing it. So you want to do the reading first and kind of form your own impressions and, and then see, see what I think what I have to say. You don't want to watch the lecture first because then you only have my interpretation. You want to do the reading first, have your own interpretation, and then let the lecture build on that. Finally is answer the question and respond to a classmate. So we have a discussion board that complements the reading and the lectures. And each week I'll pose a question and um, <clears throat> your job is to answer that question. Um, and then this is supposed to take the place of the kind of robust discussion we'd have in the classroom. So I also ask you to 
respond to a classmate as well to get that discussion going. You're only required to respond once to a classmate, but you can respond to multiple conversations, keep the conversation going. I'll try to jump in there as well and respond to some people. Um, <coughs> So really think of it as a conversation. But the minimum is that initial response to the question and then a second post where you respond to a classmate. That's the minimum. And this is to facilitate discussion. Um, so if you do these three steps each week, you'll get those weekly participation points, which are a big part of your grade, 20%. Um, obviously, the major papers are part of your grade as well. Um, and then you'll have some other assignments throughout. You usually have two week, two assignments per week. I think there's one or two weeks where you have three, but usually it's two assignments per week. So one of the assignments will be this lecture with the corresponding discussion question. The reading lecture and discussion question will be the one of the two assignments, the participation assignment. Then there'll be another assignment. Um, those will often be activities from something called inquisitive that again is linked through canvas that you can do online and those are really fun activities they're kind of like video games where you practice a skill you get better at it and as long as you continue doing the skill and the activity until you earn the full points for the activity you'll get full credit for the assignment it's not a quiz or something like that so most weeks you'll have your inquisitive assignment that's usually due on a Friday and then you'll have this discussion board post due on a Sunday um, some weeks we'll have other assignments um, to pair with the discussion board rather than the inquisitive and that might change up the due date but it'll usually be Friday and Saturday with one assignment due on Friday the other on Sunday there's one or two weeks where there's three there will also be an assignment due on Saturday but most weeks it's Friday and Sunday so again going back to that first slide just keep up on the due dates and you'll do great um, here's some information about the discussion board posts again um, the uh, discussion board is meant to take the place of a robust kind of discussion we would have in class. So I, I do ask for a significant amount of writing here. Um, you know, it's about a page per week um, in addition to whatever other assignments. But I ask that the discussion board post be at least 250 words, which I said is like a page. Answer the question fully. Sometimes there'll be multiple parts to it. Um, you don't really have to use close reading to defend your answer in this class. Um, that's more something that applies generally to all my classes. Um, you'll do that a little bit in here. What I mean by that is give some kind of evidence or support for your answer. So don't just answer the question, but to, to get to those 250 words, maybe give an example, some kind of explanation, some evidence, some reasoning, basically back up what you say. So to correct myself, you will do that in here. Um, but it doesn't in this class it doesn't always have to come from the reading is the the difference from the phrasing on the PowerPoint here so um, 250 words answer the question fully and provide some kind of evidence or support for your answer hopefully that's pretty straightforward um, your responses to classmates should be at least 150 words and advance the discussion so what I mean by advance the discussion is don't just say yeah good job you did great work um, pose a question is usually the best strategy, but do something that pushes the discussion forward. Think of it as if you were in class. If we were in class having a discussion and someone raised their hand and then you raised your hand after them, you wouldn't just say, that was a great comment. You'd say something that you felt really added to the conversation. Conceptualize it that way when you're responding to your classmates. Um, here's how the grades break down um, two points or two percent of final grade for posts that are substantive and meet these requirements um, that includes um, both posts so you'll get one point or one percent of your final grade for the <coughs> um, initial response and the other point the other percent of your grade for the response to your classmate um, the word substantive means that it's substantial and so the the two descriptions above for each type of post are what qualify those posts as substantive and if they're not substantive then um, they don't meet the requirements if they partially meet the requirements I might give you a 0.5 per each one so one point total um, but generally speaking if they don't meet the requirements you'll get a zero um, 
Usually this isn't a problem, I should say. I mean, usually the people who don't get po points are people who don't do the post at all. Um, if for any reason I think your post is not substantive and I do give you a zero, I'll be sure to write a comment explaining why. And you're always feel free to email me, ask me questions about that. Um, hopefully this makes sense. Again, I hope the discussion board is a place where we can really have some great conversations. I always look forward to reading the discussion board posts and getting in there myself and making some comments um, because I miss, I love teaching online, but I miss the kind of conversations we can have in the classroom. And, and so I hope you'll enjoy the discussion board as much as me and really get something out of the class there. These are just kind of the minimum requirements to ensure that everyone participates and becomes committed to fostering that conversation. Um, all right, so those are the basics for the class. Uh, we're going to transition now to the second part of this first lecture. In this, <coughs> this part of the lecture, is our main topic for the first week. It's called Fundamentals of Rhetoric. Um, so I want to take a moment and just ask you, what do you think of the word rhetoric? What do you think that means? Um, why would I teach it the first week? And why would I make that, in teaching it the first week, kind of a key concept, a foundational concept for the class? So maybe this would be a good point to pause the lecture and think about those questions. What is rhetoric and why is it important to the class? Okay, uh, hopefully you've paused it and taken a few minutes to try to answer that question, and now I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, <coughs> rhetoric, like the image says there, is considered, you know, the art of persuasion, how to convince people to agree with you. Um, and as we, we dive deeper here, you'll see how fundamental rhetoric is to all conversations and communications, really all aspects of our lives. Um, I think you'll be surprised, pleasantly surprised. Um, the word persuasion, which is the direct translation of rhetoric, rhetoric is a Greek word, and persuasion is the, the most direct English translation, although we don't, we don't have a precise word for the Greek word rhetoric in English. Persuasion is the closest, but it's not a perfect translation. And persuasion can have kind of a negative meaning in our culture. Sometimes people think you're being manipulative. <clears throat> but what rhetoric, what the Greeks really meant by it, was a fundamental understanding of conversation and communication so that one can convey one's ideas well. And that's beneficial to everyone, especially you and me. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. <clears throat> I want to start by going through my teaching philosophy. Not all professors will give you their teaching philosophy on the first day, but every professor has a teaching philosophy. Even if they say they don't, they still have some methodology, uh, a way in which they teach the class. Um, even if they haven't articulated it, they have some kind of framework, some kind of method for teaching the class. I like to be as transparent as possible, and, and I like my teaching philosophy. I think it's helpful to everyone. And, and I hope I think you'll like it too, so I'd like to share it with you, but it, it relates to this concept of rhetoric. You'll see the connection soon. Uh, so to sum up my teaching philosophy in one sentence, I believe that culture influences writers while writers simultaneously influence culture. Um, it's a short statement, but a complicated one at the same time, so we're going to take a couple minutes to unpack it. Culture influences writers, while writers simultaneously influence culture. I apologize for the misspelling there. Why don't you take a minute, pause this, and think about that statement. Culture influences writers, while writers simultaneously influence culture. What do you think that means? I divide it into two parts. The first I call cultural influence. A writer's background and upbringing impact their writing. What this means is as an instructor, I care about who you are, where you come from, what you believe, and I think that has a place in the classroom. So um, I'm not just here to throw my ideas at you. I want to know what you care about and see how we can make that part of your writing because it inevitably will be. Even if I try to just push my ideas on you, um, we can't help who we are or how we grew up, where we come from. Those things are important, so they, they would enter into the, 
the classroom one way or another and I think it's very important that we we draw those out and you write about something you're passionate about and express your ideas um, that can be tricky though um, people aren't always willing to listen to our ideas um, and so that's the goal here is to give you a means by which to communicate your ideas that really helps you reach people and here we transition to the second part of it what I call writerly influence this is the idea that all writers possess the power to inspire or create change so you you've been influenced by these things maybe how you grew up maybe an experience when you were younger really shaped who you are now um, but you're not just um, someone reacting to the world around them you're an agent who can create change so just as the culture has influenced you you also possess the power to influence the culture um, you can write something that creates change uh, there are obvious statements we can go to with this idea say for instance Martin Luther King's you know I have a dream speech which created all kinds of change but change can happen on a much smaller scale than that and part of my purpose in this first lecture is to convince you that you while you probably think you seem insignificant compared to someone like Martin Luther King Jr you do indeed possess the power to create change it may be small scale change but that's important too and so we're going to continue to talk about this but the takeaway here from my teaching philosophy is that who you are is important and you have the ability to create change through your writing even in this class especially in this class beginning in this class um, so here's an illustration I get that a lot of people are visual learners and I'm really down with that idea I think that sometimes an image can almost say more than the words and so if you look here you'll see you know the arrows going each direction and so it's not a chicken or the egg question um, it's a fluid thing culture is continually influencing writers and writers are continually influencing culture and that's the process um, who we are affects our writing but through our writing we can create change so hopefully the visual is helpful for you it's helpful for me um, I want to take one more minute before we kind of move on to the connection to rhetoric and just show you kind of where my teaching philosophy comes from. It's my idea, but it's been influenced by some pretty big figures in the history of rhetoric. Um, one is James Berlin, who states that the self is always a creation of a particular historical and cultural moment. And so. <clears throat> The idea of cultural influence, kind of one half of my teaching philosophy, uh, originates from this idea of Berlin's, that the things going on around us, the time in which we live, impacts us. Um, the second half comes from this other scholar named Johnson Alola, who argues that all writing creates change. And, and Johnson Alola, in his book, I'm not going to make you read it, but in his book he does a good job <clears throat> of illustrating how all writing creates change. While it's obvious that um, a big speech like the I Have a Dream speech creates change, Johnson Alola is really the one who shows how all writing can create change even on a small scale. So again, it depends on how we interpret the concept of writing. And in this class, following in the line of these scholars, I intend to interpret the term writing as broadly as possible. And, and Johnson Alola could really say all communication creates change. So you could give some speech that inspires lots of people to take up an important cause. Um, you might also write a memo or an email at work that convinces people to go a certain direction on a project, and that's very important. It could even be as simple as having a conversation with your friend, and you're trying to decide what movie to go to, and your friend really wants to see one movie, and you want to see a different movie, and you end up persuading your friend to see the movie you want to see. Um, so we can create change in all, all different kinds of ways, um, and we can do that through writing and through communication. So I think these quotes are, it's fairly self-evident how these two quotes influence the two halves of my teaching philosophy. Hopefully it's an empowering philosophy for you. One last statement, which is kind of the other half of Johnson Alola's statement, is that anything can be a text. And this is just to show you that 
again, text is the term I use instead of paper or essay because we're interpreting it as broadly as possible. So a text could be a paper or an essay. It could also be an email. It could be a text message. It could be a web page. It could be a painting. It could be a meme. It could be a conversation you have with someone. And so we want to interpret the terms writing or communication and text as broadly as possible to understand how my teaching philosophy can really be helpful. Not just in this class, but in context beyond this class. Which comes back to what I said at the start of the lesson. Um, I don't want to just help you get an A and pass this class because you need to graduate and you want good grades. I do want to do that. But I also want to help you to become so effective at communication that you are very successful with your all kinds of goals. Um, education goals, career goals. Um, some of these ideas can even be applied, say, in personal life as you interact with people socially. Um, these ideas can be very helpful in relationships So, um, as you interact with other people. So um, we want to interpret these concepts as broadly as possible. Know that your writing should be as specific as possible, but I want to teach you some fundamental skills that, and when I, when I say understood as broadly as possible, so that these skills are fundamental enough you can apply them in almost any situation, not just the situation of this class. Um, <clears throat> and the writing you do in this class will be one way of demonstrating that you've learned these skills. And that's why the writing will be specific. But you can then take these broad skills and apply them to all kinds of other specific situations beyond the papers for this class. And that's the real goal here. All right, so <clears throat> to kind of sum up where we've been so far, all writing can create change. I'm hoping you learn how to do that in this class. Now I'm going to show you the means or the method for creating change. And that's where this concept of rhetoric that was on the start of the slideshow, that's where it comes into play. Rhetoric is the means by which we create change. And there's three different concepts we're going to go through here all related to rhetoric. The first is rhetorical situation. So a rhetorical situation is any situation you can think of that requires um, communication. Any situation where you have an author or a communicator and an audience. Someone giving a message and someone receiving a message. Any situation where someone is giving a message and someone is receiving a message is a rhetorical situation. Now I try not to put too much on the PowerPoint. I try to keep my PowerPoint very minimal because if I just have that spelled on the screen that a rhetorical situation is any situation where someone gives a message and someone else receives a message, um, that wouldn't help you remember it as well. I'm hoping you're writing some of these types of things down as we're going through the lesson because then you'll remember it better. And so I've given you the definition of a rhetorical situation out loud. Now I'd like to go through the different parts of a rhetorical situation. And those are the bullets I have on here. Um, <clears throat> so a rhetorical situation is any situation where someone is giving a message and someone else is receiving a message. So anytime you're writing or communicating, that's a rhetorical situation. Writing a paper for a class, giving a presentation, lots of other everyday things, going on a job interview, texting your friends, convincing your parents to loan you money, convincing your friend where to go or where to eat, breaking up with somebody, um, planning a family vacation. The idea here is really anything can be a rhetorical situation. And as we get further in the lesson, and then as you do your discussion board, um, hopefully you'll, you'll start to see that. Um, so some of the parts of a rhetorical situation, the first is purpose. You have to have a goal. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, do you want your parents to loan you money? Do you want an employer to hire you? Do you want your friend to go to Arby's instead of Subway? You have a purpose or a goal. A goal would be another good word, a synonym for purpose. You have an audience. So the purpose, the person sending the message has a purpose or a goal. The audience is the person or people receiving the message. An audience is very important. When we write, it's really easy to um, well, we write in isolation. Writing is something we do by ourselves. 
So it's really easy to kind of just think about ourselves and what information we need for it to be effective writing. But to truly be successful at writing, we need to think about our audience. Audience is everything. So if you want to convince your parents to loan you money to buy a car, you have to think about your parents and how do you justify that to your parents. It's clear why you want the car, but it may not be as clear to them. So think about what they believe, what they value, and create a text that reaches that audience rather than you. So, um, but it's beneficial to you because if you're effective, then you achieve your purpose. And the best way to be effective is to connect with the audience. So, interpreting a rhetorical situation is kind of the fundamental key to good writing or good communication, to creating change. You think about your goal, you think about your audience, what they believe in value, and then you answer the question, what do I then do to achieve my purpose, to reach this audience so that I achieve my purpose? Um, how do I build a bridge to that audience? There are some other aspects of the rhetorical situation. Genre, what in what genre are you taking part? Is it a conversation? Is it a written paper? There's different kind of rules for each genre, so that's something you want to think through. And in this class, you'll get practice writing in some different genres. That's important to practice. <clears throat> what is your stance? Stance and purpose are very similar, but a stance is more of a statement, whereas a purpose is a goal. Sometimes the goal may be unspoken. Um, the think of the stance as like the thesis statement of the paper, and the purpose or the goal is the reason why you're writing the paper. The last one is meteor design. What does it look like? Um, is it written? Is it visual? Is it some combination of both? Um, we'll, we'll work on this in this class too. We have some assignments in here that can combine visual and written communication because I believe in the 21st century that's key to effective communication is combining different media, the verbal and the written. That should be part of the design of the text in the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> so purpose and audience are the two most important here and then these others are kind of other important factors but purpose and audience are the key. And, and so just kind of sum up, a rhetorical situation is a situation where one is sending a message to someone else and that message takes the form of a text. Going back to Johnson and Lola, we're interpreting the idea of a text as broadly as possible. So you have a goal, you have an audience, you produce a text that ideally will reach that audience. What goes into the text? Is it a conversation? Is it a memo? Is it a painting? What is the text? But you always produce a text in response to the rhetorical situation to try to reach your audience. We're going to go on now to the second part here, which is a little bit more about how to produce the text. Um, and so when you create a text, whether you're writing a long paper for a class or just talking to someone, that text, that conversation, whatever it is, um, has some elements. You have to think about the design of that, like we just talked about. So what goes into it? Something that goes into it is rhetorical appeals. And rhetorical appeals here is kind of the second half of your reading for the week. You had two readings. One was all about rhetorical situation. The other is about making arguments, and that section talks about rhetorical appeals. So these are things your audience cares about. And the idea here is you're going to appeal to the things they care about. The first is credibility. And the Greek word for this is ethos. So appealing to their sense of credibility. They want you to be a reliable source. They want to feel like they can trust you. By they, I mean your audience. So depending on what the situation is, you want to present yourself a certain way. You know, in a job interview, you probably want to dress nice. In a letter to get a job interview, you probably want to use formal language, just like you would in a paper for this class. On a Facebook post, you probably don't want to use formal language. Um, you want to use language that's um, pertinent to that rhetorical situation. Um, in a class like this, it can often come in the form of citing credible sources, but there's not that's not all there is to it because it, it applies in any rhetorical situation. Uh, next is pathos or emotion. 
You want to appeal to your readers' emotions. You want to get them to feel something. You're passionate about your idea. You want them to be passionate about your idea. Logos, I would argue, is the most important one. It depends on the situation, um, but most of the time, logos will be the most important. Logos is a logical reason. Now, when I go over this in class, a lot of times people think of facts and statistics, and those can be good examples. But the true definition, write this down, the true definition of logos or logical reasoning is a thought process. So if you have facts or statistics, those facts or statistics prove a claim you're making, a stance. But how do they prove that stance? That's where logos comes in. That's the logical reasoning. So you have some numbers that reflect something you believe. You would then explain to your audience what those numbers mean and why they prove what you believe. And that's logical reasoning. Um, and it doesn't have to just be facts or statistics. You can use any kind of evidence or example, a picture, a quote, anything you want. Um, and you don't always have to use an example, but it's a thought process that explains your idea to the reader. That's logos. Um, and obviously, in, say in a paper for a class like this, it's the most important one of these. Um, in other situations, we're about to look at some commercials as examples. Ethos and pathos might be more important. But in most situations, logos is going to be most important. Um, you're writing a letter, a cover letter, to try to get a job interview. You, you want the reasons you give the employer to hire you to be very logical reasons. Um, you, uh, well, even in any situation, if, if it just doesn't make sense, people probably aren't going to be convinced. Um, they'll say that doesn't make sense and move on. As important as the other appeals are, it almost always comes down to that fundamental issue. So logos is very important. The last one is kairos. Um, the textbook doesn't talk about this one, but it's very important. So it's kind of the overlooked but very important rhetorical appeal. So I want to include it here. Um, <clears throat> Kairos was the Greek god of, I don't remember what he was the god of, but he was a Greek god and he could run super fast. He was the like the flash in Greek mythology, but he had a long ponytail. And the myth said that if, you, if one reached out at just the right time, they had to time it perfectly because he was so fl fast. But if one reached out at just the right time, they could grab his ponytail and catch Kairos, which is pretty cool. And so Kairos is an appeal to the reader's sense of timeliness. Um, like the Latin phrase carpe diem, seizing the moment or seizing the day. Um, you want to give an argument to your audience that's appealing right now, that appeals to their sense of the moment, their sense of what's important right now. I've had students write very good papers, but that were on very outdated topics, situations or issues that had really already been resolved. Um, so, so Kairos is kind of making everything fit just right, would be another way to say it. The last part here is rhetorical sensitivity. And this is really just to sum up. Rhetorical sensitivity is the ability to achieve one's purpose in a wide variety of rhetorical situations. So this is foundational, this is key to good writing, to good communication, and, and that's why we're studying it first in this class. So in every writing situation, you have a purpose and an audience. If you achieve your purpose, then you're effective, you found success. That's what I want to teach you to do in this class. That's my goal for this class. Rhetorical sensitivity is a term that refers to being able to find that success in more than one situation. So you might be really good at writing papers for classes. When I was really good, when I was an undergrad, I was really good at writing papers for classes. But I had absolutely no social skills. No one invited me to parties because I would say the wrong thing. I was very awkward. Since I've been married, I've been married for seven years now, my wife has really helped me with this. Um, but I was a one-trick pony before my marriage. I didn't have good rhetorical sensitivity. It's still not great for me, but it's getting better. I hope that by the end of this class, you'll have great rhetorical sensitivity. Certainly one goal for this class is to write academically so that you can do well at the university. But I don't want you to just do well at the university. I want you to get a great job. I want you to communicate well with your coworkers, so on and so forth. And so the goal for this class is not just to learn to write academically, but to master rhetorical sensitivity so that you have great papers for classes, but you also write a great cover letter when you apply for a job. You 
do a good interview so you get hired for the job you do well in the job when you have to write memos when you have to give presentations when you have to interact with coworkers so that you have great relationships beyond that because you communicate with people well that you um, write great Facebook posts that you create great memes um, that you're not a one-trick pony um, that's rhetorical sensitivity that's the goal for the class because all writing creates change so how do you change someone's mind through your writing you understand the purpose the situation you create the appropriate text you've mastered rhetorical sensitivity you've created change hopefully it makes sense um, and hopefully it's a helpful idea um, that you can get on board with because um, if you can I think the class can be really helpful and obviously email me if you have any questions at all or or come by my office on campus I'd love to talk to you um, we have one last thing here oh before we go to the last thing I want to give you another illustration and this illustrates what I just said um, so you have purpose and you have an audience and the rhetorical appeals that you incorporate into your text are how you build the bridge to that audience so these arrows here illustrate that connection a purpose an audience whether or not you achieve your purpose is contingent on the audience the rhetorical appeals help you reach your audience and when you're assessing the rhetorical situation and deciding how to respond you want to think about what your audience believes and values that may be very close to what you believe and value sometimes it may be different sometimes it may be really different so you want to find some kind of common ground to connect to them to give you an example I once had a student writing a paper on biodiversity loss which is the extinction of different species so that there are fewer types of species in the world obviously people who care about the animals and the environment would be really into this but not everyone cares about that so how do you reach the people who don't well he this student then went on and researched the topic and learned that through biodiversity loss people will actually get more diseases develop more allergies and so he was able to make an argument then that did not just reach the animal lovers but also reached people in general because biodiversity loss affects humanity as well um, so you want to find that common ground build that bridge to your audience all right so the last part of this lecture will be an example like I said each lecture will be kind of a practical skill a method a skill something you learn that will help you in your writing and your communication and then we'll look at an example that illustrates it <clears throat> um, this lecture is a little bit longer because we had that introduction to the course for the first part of it um, so we're going to look at two examples one that's a really good job of using rhetoric and then one that's not that great of a job of using rhetoric in the f they're both commercials because commercials are short easy to analyze just as kind of examples to illustrate this skill of rhetorical sensitivity um, the first one is the sweat it to get it commercial series my favorite is one where this guy goes into a 7-eleven to buy some Gatorade and he's not an athletic guy as you can tell by the picture the guy the counter working at the store is a little more fit he clearly works out um, this guy's buying chips as well as Gatorade so you get the idea um, the guy at the counter tells him you can't buy these and he says why not he says you have to sweat it to get it and the guy is kinda mad and he says the worker says it's not my policy it's his and then Cam Newton you know the star NFL quarterback comes in and the guy's all excited ah, I'm seeing the celebrity and then Cam Newton just swats the Gatorades out of his hand so it's really funny that's the commercial YouTube it if you haven't seen it um, here's what we call rhetorical analysis I'm now going to analyze this commercial and explain how it uses rhetoric effectively so the purpose is to sell Gatorade the audience is obviously athletes but it could be anyone really if you're selling a product of course you want athletes to buy it but you own a company you want as many people as possible to buy it um, how does the ad use the rhetorical appeals um, ethos you have Cam Newton he's an athlete he's a recognizable figure the products based around working out he's a star athlete that's a very credible source for a product that's based around working out pathos what's the emotions involved humor it makes you laugh it's really funny when he swats the Gatorade out of this guy's hands and that creates a memorable moment you're in the store you're trying to decide to buy Gatorade or Powerade you look at the Gatorade you see the Powerade you don't remember anything about Powerade but you see Gatorade you think Cam Newton 
That was funny. I'm buying that one. Kairos, they're using Cam Newton. He just won MVP a couple years ago. He's famous now. It's not Doug Flutie, you know, or someone from the 90s. Um, but here we'll get to the real success of this commercial, why it's effective. The message is sweat it to get it. Why is that effective? What's the logic behind that? Um, it makes it sound like only certain people can buy a product. Why would someone create an ad where it says this is, this is only for certain people, other people can't have it? Pause the lecture, think about that for a minute. What I'd say is this, even if you don't work out, even if you're not in this elite group that can buy this product according to Gatorade and Cam Newton, doesn't that make you want it? People want what they can't have. People want what they're told they can't have. If you tell someone they can't do something, they go out and do it usually. So by saying sweat it to get it, that's going to make all people, not just athletes, want Gatorade. And so there's an element of ethos there. It's a select group of which people want to be a part. And then there's some logic. Gatorade replaces the uh, electrolytes you lose when you sweat. Um, so it's a pretty effective ad for all these reasons, and I think it effectively markets Gatorade. These fundamental concepts apply in any situation, not just commercials, not just Gatorade commercials. So in any situation, you want to rhetorically analyze the purpose in the audience to understand what kind of text you want to create. But the writers of the ad looked at the situation and decided to create this commercial, this text with Cam Newton. and. And I love to hear what you think, but I think it's pretty effective. Now we're going to look at an example of ineffective communication. Um, so you've probably all heard of or seen the Sarah McLaughlin commercial with the sad puppies. It plays her really sad, sappy, in the arms of an angel song, and it shows all these pictures of three-legged puppies, other wounded puppies. Um, and the fact that there's this meme here, and if you Google this commercial as I did to find a meme, to find an image for a PowerPoint, you'll see lots of memes. And this commercial has really been made fun of. And, and so we might be able to find some ways in which it's effective, but the way it's been kind of culturally made fun of that you can find that very easily with a Google search really shows why it's ineffective. Um, people feel like their day has been ruined when they watch this ad. Let's talk about her purpose is to convince people to donate to the organization that helps animals. The audience is obviously animal lovers, but again, because it's an ad, anyone really, right? Like, obviously animal lovers should donate or will donate, but if they can get more people to donate, that only helps their cause. How does Sarah McLaughlin use the rhetorical appeals? Well, she's a singer, she's a celebrity. It's maybe not as direct a connection to the product as Cam Newton, but there's still that kind of celebrity recognition. Pathos, it makes people sad. I don't know if that's an effective appeal. We'll talk about that, but that's the way they try to use pathos here. The logical connection is pretty straightforward. The money will help the puppies if you donate money. But that's not at the center of the ad, and I think that's part of the problem. The Gatorade commercial has a very clever concept based on logos at the center of the ad. Kairos, this is maybe one of the stronger appeals here. It's a sense of urgency. Um, these puppies are in trouble and they need your help. Here's why I deem it ineffective. It's too long. It's almost two minutes. It's too much sad music. It's too many sad puppies. It becomes overwhelming to the viewer, even animal lovers. I show this in class when I teach the same lesson in the face-to-face -face classroom and it's often too overwhelming for students. I turn it off after about 10 seconds, even though it's two minutes long, because they're like, stop, stop, and I don't want to see it either. Um, <clears throat> I once had a student um, say that she worked at PetSmart and loves animals, and this ad actually made her not want to um, give money to the organization because she said it just made her too sad. She loved animals so much, she didn't want to see them this way. So, um, I'm not saying it's not effective on some level. I mean, I really like animals. I have a, a puppy named Kenny that I love. Um, I have other dogs in the past I've loved too. Um, and we, can, we certainly want to give 
to this organization out of kind of the decency of our hearts, but in terms of creating a text to try to achieve this purpose, I think it's just it's too overwhelming for the viewers. It gives them too much. It shows them something that they love and danger, which can be compelling, and it probably works for some people, but it's not going to reach a mass amount of people the way the other ad does. Um, and so again, ads are just kind of a quick example to show you these skills in practice. The real takeaway here is not just these ads. Those are an example. The real takeaway is I want to look at my audience, think about my goal, figure out what to do to achieve my goal. These are some examples of how other people have done that. And that's what I'll say on this final slide. We can create change through our writing, through our communication, by mastering rhetorical sensitivity. We can create change on Facebook. We can create change in conversations. We can create change by writing papers in the classroom. It takes rhetorical sensitivity to do so in each of those very different situations. Um, so I hope that's what you're able to do by the end of this class, and that's what we're going to start working on now. So thank you for being in the class with me. I really look forward to working with you.